to announce uh, the last talk uh, of this day. The talk will be given by uh, Piotr Nowak from uh, Institute of Mathematics of Polish Academy of Sciences. And the uh, title of the talk is Property T for Automorphism Groups of Free Groups. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I visited Bangalore a couple of times before, before but uh, I've never been here. So it's, it's wonderful to visit this fantastic institute. Um, okay, so uh, I will continue uh, what Marek started uh, and uh, I will try to describe um, how do you prove, uh, the, the main point will be uh, to describe how do you prove uh, the infinite case. Uh, I will give a little bit of an overview of property T and the methods again, so I won't uh, avoid uh, some repetition, but it'll be maybe perhaps a slightly different take. Um, um, yeah. Okay, so let's recall the definition. So this is the standard definition uh, of property T. So we have a locally compact group with a compact generating set. And uh, uh, we ask uh, that, um, uh, right, so, so first we do define what are almost invariant vectors. So these are vectors that uh, satisfy this almost invariance condition uh, on, on, on your generating set. And then uh, property T, the standard uh, definition of property T is that G has property T if every unitary representation of G, uh, whenever it has almost invariant vectors, it has a non-trivial invariant vector. Okay, so the, this is the definition that was essentially used in Kajdan's original work. And uh, uh, another way to phrase this particular one is that the trivial representation is an isolated point in the unitary dual uh, equipped with the Feld topology. Uh, so there's not that many groups um, that have property T, right? So we have uh, SLNZ and higher rank league groups and their lattices. This was Ajdan's original uh, result. Then in the middle of the 90s, there was another um, wave of, uh, of results on property T, uh, which uh, were automorphism groups of thick buildings. So, so buildings are, um, uh, thick buildings are, are uh, buildings that exhibit a lot of uh, higher dimensional branching uh, and uh, automorphism groups of such buildings uh, uh, do have property T. And then there was uh, another, uh, using actually the same methods as the previous one, uh, that certain random hyperbolic groups uh, in the Gromov density model also have property T. This was proved by Juk. So I'm, I'm, I'm not listing all the, uh, there are some other ones as well, but uh, just, just to recall some basic facts. And uh, it's easy to see a lot of groups uh, do not have property T, so, um, so, uh, the, I guess you can see amenable groups um, right away from the definition, free groups. Uh, uh, that's because property T is in, uh, inherited by quotients. Um, there's also a definition, uh, a characterization of property T in terms of proper affine isometric action, actions on Hilbert spaces or vanishing of cohomology. So property T has, a, a group has property T if and only if every affine isometric action on a Hilbert space has a fixed point, equivalently if, if cohomology with unitary coefficients always vanishes, the first cohomology. Uh, so, so groups that have proper affine isometric actions on Hilbert spaces don't have property T. Uh, and some standard applications uh, are um, uh, e e examples of expanders so these were given uh, by uh, Margulis. Uh, so you take a residually finite uh, group with property T. And the property T assumption is missing here, but it should be here. So you take a residually finite property T group uh, and you take normal subgroups uh, that intersect trivially, then the Cayley graph forms a sequence of expanders. So these, these were uh, the first explicit examples. Uh, then property T is also used uh, uh, in index theory. So uh, it blocks uh, a certain method of proving uh, 
the bomb con conjecture, uh, the so-called Dirac dual Dirac method, and it's the source. Uh, well, property T and and, and uh, expanders are the sources of uh, counterexamples uh, to various types of bomb con type conjectures. So to the uh, coarse bomb con conjecture and to the bomb con uh, conjecture with uh, coefficients. Uh, and then uh, property T also implies uh, various rigidity properties for dynamical systems and operator uh, algebra. So, uh, so for instance, there's uh, our theorems like the Fisher-Margulis uh, local rigidity theorem, uh, which says that if you have two smooth actions on a smooth manifold and uh, of a property T group, if they're close enough, uh, uh, and if they're sufficiently close in an appropriate sense, then they're actually conjugate. Uh, or you can have uh, rigidity uh, theorems for operator algebras. Uh, so there's there's a whole um, universe of uh, results um, on this by uh, by Soying Popa and Stefan Vaz, where you try to and Adrian Yan and many others, where you try to prove that if uh, if you have to uh, von Neumann algebras associated to, a, to an action or to a group. Uh, if, uh, in a, if in an appropriate sense, property T is involved, then you can show that if the algebras are isomorphic, then the, the, for instance, the actions are conjugate or orbit equivalent or something like this. Okay, so this, these are the types of results uh, that you can, that you can uh, prove using property T. So the, the main object uh, of, uh, of uh, our interest today is the group of automorphisms of the free group. Uh, so there are two of these. So there's the, the full group of automorphisms and the outer uh, automorphism group, which is just uh, you mod out all the inner ones. Uh, so there's the, the abelianization map from the free group to uh, z to the power n, and it induces a uh, uh, a surjection from odd fn onto GLN z. So this surjection, so this this second map here for n equal to two, this is a uh, an isomorphism. Okay, and as Marek mentioned, uh, odd fn can be thought of as non-commutative analogs of of uh, these linear groups. Okay, so the question we're, we're uh, discussing uh, today is does odd fn or out fn uh, have property t? Uh, so, the, so the reason uh, why this is a natural question is this, uh, is this uh, uh, well-known um, analogy that's, that's uh, um, very fruitful in, in geometric group theory, uh, that's the three families of groups uh, so linear groups, uh, outer automorphisms or automorphisms group, automorphism groups of free groups and mapping class groups should have similar properties. And this, uh, this is motivated by the fact that, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, by this fact for n equal to two. So the, the, uh, for the, for the first examples, they're all isomorphic. So, so out of two is isomorphic to GL2Z. And they're, they're also isomorphic to the mapping class group of the torus. Okay, so the, this is where this analogy comes from. And, and because of this, uh, the question about property T for odd fn or out of fn, uh, as well for the mapping class group is, uh, uh, is a very natural one. So this, uh, so the, so the, for the low indices, it was known not to be the case. I think this, this was also mentioned by Marek. So, uh, so, out of, so um, for n equal to two, this follows from this previous surjection. And for out of three, uh, there are surjections of finite index subgroups onto Z and onto FK uh, by McCool and then later by Grunewald and Lubotsky. So, so these groups don't have property T and property T is inherited by quotient. So, um, so out of three and out of three cannot have property T. Okay, so, so if you want to, prove property T for one of these groups? Uh, uh, well, the, the first question is, I guess, uh, can we use one of the older methods or used for instance, uh, for, um, by Kajdan or, or for these, uh, 
uh, automorphism groups of buildings. And so there, there are two main, uh, these are the two main methods. So, so the algebraic method, so-called. So if you know enough about, uh, this is very vague what I'm going to, to say, but if you, if you know um, essentially some, some so the algebraic structure well enough and you know the representation theory, then you can uh, blend the two th together in the case of, uh, in the case of linear groups and, uh, and, uh, and use that. Uh, and the geometric method, which is uh, the one used for the, for the automorphism groups of buildings is um, you, uh, you look at some local uh, information about the building itself. So, so what one does is one uh, looks at links at, of, of vertices. These links are finite graphs. And if on each of these graphs, uh, the Laplacian uh, on the graph has uh, the first positive eigenvalue strictly greater than one half, then it turns out that the group has property T. So, uh, so this is uh, some kind of a positive curvature condition. Um, and, uh, and it's a very different method, of course, um, than the previous one. Now, both, both of these methods are out of reach for, for these groups. Of course, we don't know anything or much. Uh, uh, well, I should say, we don't know enough uh, about the algebraic structure or the representation theory of any of these groups. And then when, uh, when it comes to the other method, there are some, uh, some geometric models of spaces on which uh, these groups act. Uh, however, again, they're not uh, they're, they're not uh, sufficiently well behaved to be able to be usable in this setting. Okay, so let's recall what uh, what Marek uh, mentioned, uh, what Marek, Marek uh, explained. So we will be working in the in the real group ring. And this is the Laplacian. So the Laplacian is the is an element of the real group ring. Um, and uh, the the new methods that uh, that we will be using emerged from uh, a result of Taka. I think it was as a preprint in 2014 and then published in 2016. Uh, and he showed that G has property T if and only if there exists a positive. Kappa and finally many elements in the group ring such that delta squared minus kappa delta is a sum of squares. Okay, so this is, this is a breakthrough. Uh, it's, a, it's a five page paper, uh, but it's, it's really uh, uh, an amazing breakthrough in the sense that uh, as Marek mentioned, uh, delta squared minus kappa delta being positive in the, the maximal group C star algebra, which is a completion of the uh, of the complex group ring, that's a standard uh, standard way of characterizing uh, property T. It's it's relatively uh, straightforward to see uh, that it's equivalent to property T. However, here this this is uh, saying the same thing. However, before the completion, right? So we're finding a witness uh, to this positivity. Uh, that's, that's, that lies in the, in the group ring itself. So this is, uh, this is quite amazing. And, uh, and the key thing is of course, that this is a finite dimensional condition. So what it tells you is, is uh, that the property T is decided on a finite subset of your group, okay? which is again, for such a powerful property, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's surprising. I, this was known before uh, that that it can be decided on the, but but here it's in this sense it's uh, it's really uh, impressive. Okay, so the strategy. Let's recall what the strategy is for proving uh, these types uh, of theorems. So there are two main steps. So as Marek has explained. Uh, what one does is one tries to uh, take this equation and uh, fix a subset in, in a group, okay? And you try to find uh, these psi i's and kappa 
which would solve this equation on a given subset of a group, right? And it sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so this, this side is expressed uh, as uh, using this positive uh, definite matrix, and then one can do uh, positive uh, semi-definite uh, programming to find the answer. Okay, but the problem again is that once you use this uh, SDP solver to, to obtain a solution, this solution uh, has a numerical error built into it, right? So it's not an actual solution. So there is this procedure uh, called certification, which uh, shows that uh, from the existence of the approximate numerical solution, uh, if if it's sufficiently accurate, one can deduce the existence of an actual solution. Okay, so this is what Marek uh, was explaining in the previous uh, in the previous lecture. So this is this is crucial because this uh, just the first step uh, will only give us some intuition about what's going on, and it's the second step that turns this into a rigorous proof. So so here this depends on maybe I. I I should uh, recall this again. So here, this certification depends on computing the L1 norm of the numerical error, and this uh, numerical error, uh, and this L1 norm is computed in interval arithmetic, which makes this, uh, which makes this rigorous. Okay, so, um, so when Taka proved his, uh, uh, his characterization, uh, in his in his uh, paper already in I think in the introduction, uh, he stated that uh, he expects that th this this condition uh, will allow to to look for examples of property T groups uh, using computer assistance. Okay, and very quickly after this, uh, Tim Netzer and Andreas Tom implemented this. Okay, so they in 2015 they used this method to reprove property T for SL3Z. Okay, so for SL3Z, there is a bunch of, uh, a bunch of proofs uh, of, um, uh, of uh, property T. Uh, however, what happens in the process uh, is, uh, there, is a, there is a constant involved, this, this kappa, and it's related to the Kajdan constant, which I'll, I think I have defined later on. Uh, and, uh, once you get your solution, a part of the solution is an estimate on this constant kappa. So delta squared minus kappa delta. And this constant kappa uh, gives an estimate, uh, a lower bound on the Kajdan constant. And this, what they did allowed them to improve the estimate on the Kajdan constant by from, from more or less one over, uh, one over 1800 to uh, a little bit over one over six. Okay, and then um, uh, Koji Fujiwara and Yuichi Kabaya, they did this for n equal to three and four, slightly improving the estimates. Uh, and at the same time with Marek, we, uh, we uh, discussed uh, SL3, four and five, and we also wrote a paper on this um, with slightly improved estimates. So now the, the goal here uh, is that you, uh, once you, as Marek was explaining, once you get a group, so first, for once once you get a group and you want to check property T, with this method alone, what you need to do is you make you need to make a computation for 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 each group you need to make a computation, right? So if you get a group, you make a computation, right? So so this is what was done here. But what happens is you have to you fix the set on which you're looking for on on which you're looking for the solution, right? And uh, these groups. I mean, in, 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 in all the reasonable cases, the natural choice is the smallest set uh, that you can choose, that, that you can think of, which is the ball of radius two. So we assume that the, the psi i's, the, the square, the, the elements that give you the sum of squares, that they are supported on the ball of radius two. Okay, and uh, in these groups, as, as the index gets higher, of course, this ball of radius two gets larger and larger. This influences the size of the matrix and uh, the problem becomes harder and harder, right? So I'm not sure exactly. So is SL6 something computable at this point? On the verge, yeah. 
But SL5, I think, is the largest, um, the largest that, uh, that can be computed quickly, right? And uh, if you think about it, the, the same issue, uh, even, even more pronounced, uh, is, is you encounter the same issue when you try to enlarge the set on which you're uh, looking for a solution. Because if you start with the ball of radius two and then you try to look for something on the ball of radius three, because of exponential growth, these balls get very large very quickly. Okay, so, uh, so from the numerical perspective, there are actually some serious uh, restrictions on how far you can go with these. Okay. All right, so we're going to be working not with uh, FN itself, but with a subgroup of uh, index two, which I think you also defined. Uh, so this, uh, so this is the special automorphism group, uh, which is precisely the pre-image of SLNZ under this abelianization map. Okay, the more explicit, uh, the more explicit um, description is that it's generated by these Nielsen transformations, which are uh, transformations which uh, act on generating n tuples of the free group. And uh, they're, they multiply the ith element, the, the ith generator by the jth generator on the left or on the right, uh, and either, the, uh, uh, either by the generator or its inverse. Um, and, and so you get two families of these, okay? So these are, these are the elements of odd Fn that generate this special automorphism group. Uh, and yeah, and this group has index two in odd Fn. Okay, these Nielsen transformations should be thought of as, uh, as non-commutative um, non uh, counterparts of uh, row and column operations. So of, uh, uh, elementary matrices. All right, so the main results, uh, this one is uh, what Marek already stated, I think. Uh, the, this was the first one for S odd F5. Uh, and uh, so what you get here is also an estimate uh, on the Kajdan constant, uh, which is, uh, so the Kajdan constant, uh, this is what we needed the the original definition for. So uh, it's uh, the, the best constant. So, it, so uh, another way to phrase the definition is if you have a unitary representation without invariant vectors, then there must be a, a constant for your representation, which uh, such that every generators, uh, one of the generators moves every vector by at least that constant, okay? And so this Kajdan constant is a constant that works for all representations. It's easy to see uh, that, that once, once this constant for every representation is positive, then it has, there has to be a uniform one. And then this is the one that works for, for all unitary representations. Uh, but our focus now will be, uh, will be the second statement, which was the, uh, which, which came after uh, S sort of five. So the obvious question uh, after S sort of five was, does does this carry on for uh, to, to all the higher um, to all the higher FNs uh, S sort of FNs, right? So so this was the assumption that it should be behave like that. That once you have property T at some point for for odd FN, then it uh, it it should be uh, it should be above a certain index. Um, so this was the question. Right, and, and so the statement is that it actually has property T for all n greater or equal than six. So together with this, we get for all n greater or equal than five. All right, so one more thing I want to introduce is another parameter that you can introduce if you have this, um, if you have this um, uh, characterization of, uh, of Ozawa. Uh, which is, uh, we, we called it the Kajdan radius. So once you have this kind of decomposition, so once you have a property T group, you know that you will have 
uh, this kind of decomposition uh, for delta squared minus lambda delta. So the Kirchhoff radius is the smallest uh, r such that you can find the psi i's supported in the ball of radius r in your group. Okay, so basically how small is the set for which you need for witnessing property T. Okay, so this is a similar, uh, in a similar spirit uh, to, to the Kajdan constant. And in the end, I'll, I'll state uh, versions of these, uh, versions of these theorems, um, which are, which are, uh, which involve Kajdan constants and the Kajdan radius. So the, the, the reason why, why this, uh, uh, why this might be, uh, of interest is once once you know that these psi i's are um, are are uh, supported on a particular ball, then you also have control over uh, which quotients you can push this down to. Okay, so uh, so basically, um, once you control the sets on which the psi i's are supported, then then you can simply copy this finite set onto certain quotients as long as the, this finite set in the finite quotient um, looks the same, yes. On the generating set as well, yes, sorry, yes, I didn't mention this, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, the Ozawa radius? Uh, may, maybe, <laughs> maybe we should have, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, so, so uh, let's, uh, let's try to then uh, see how we can, how we can prove uh, property T for an infinite family. So the, the problem is obvious, right? So with this method, which is the only method which works for, for these automorphism groups, uh, so far, what we've been able to do was once you get a group, you get a single computation, you can check property T, right? Or you can try to prove property T. Uh, and here we have a family, infinite family of groups. So it's, it's, uh, this is out of question. So we have to do something else, right? So uh, everything I'll describe will work at the same time for SRFN generated by Nielsen transformations, as well for SLN generated by elementary matrices. Okay, so, uh, so we need to set this up uh, a little bit. So we have uh, GNs forming a tower of inclusions, right? In both cases, we just add another generated, generator uh, and, and we get an inclusion for, um, for, the, for the groups uh, S, F, N, and GLN. And uh, I, I want to consider a simplex. So this will, this will uh, mainly be uh, in order to visualize what's going on. So the simplex is not maybe necessary, but it helps to, uh, to uh, visualize what's going on. So I will look at um, uh, a simplex on the indices one through N and uh, EN will be the set of uh, edges, which are the unordered pairs, okay? So um, I have an action on the alternating, of the alternating group on the edges. That's uh, fairly standard. And uh, I have a map. So, so since my edges are, are, are unordered pairs of indices ij, to each edge, I can simply assign uh, generators in both groups with those indices. Okay, so what this does is that uh, to each edge, I'm essentially attaching a copy of either GL2, uh, sorry, SL2 or SRF2, okay? And uh, now given two edges, so this will become important later. So given two edges, if I have two edges, they, there are three things that can happen between them. So either this, they can be the same edge, they can be adjacent or they can be opposite. Right, so they share no vertices. So for this, you need at least four vertices. So, so this is, uh, uh, starts from SL3. Uh, and the corresponding copies of G, uh, of G2, so for of SL2 and, and SL2, uh, attached to opposite edges 
they commute. Okay, so now on every, on every, uh, for every edge uh, and for each of these copies, in each of these copies uh, of G2, I have uh, its own Laplacian, right? So I have, uh, uh, and I can, um, yes, yeah, sorry. So, so yeah, so for GN, I want to define by delta N, uh, de denote by delta N the Laplacian. And for each for each edge, I also have the the Laplacian associated to that particular edge, right? And uh, we also have uh, the action of the alternating group, uh, which uh, uh, which which uh, preserves uh, uh, which uh, um, permutes these uh, these um, uh, Laplacians as well. Okay, so here's here's the picture of everything uh, that I said. So so we have the so here's the simplex. We have the action of the alternating group. So we have two edges. Uh, so, sorry. So we have an edge, and we have two uh, groups um, associated to this uh, to this particular edge. Here is another edge. This edge is opposite. So the green edge is opposite to the blue one. So the copies uh, here commute. Uh, these two are adjacent, so the copies do not commute. Okay, and uh, and to each sorry, and to each uh, to each edge, I also have a copy uh, of the Laplacian uh, in SL SL of two or SL two uh, associated to each edge. Okay, and these Laplacians also get permuted by the action of the alternating. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, it should be one, two, three, four. Sorry, yes, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so the first uh, observation is that these edges, the, the Laplacians associated to the edges are the building blocks of the full Laplacians in the, in the group GN. Okay, so the, if you sum up the Laplacians over the edges, then you get the Laplacian in, the, in your whole group GN, okay? But there's more happening. Namely, what you can do is you can take a single edge and act on the Laplacian by the whole alternating group. And you also get the full Laplacian just up to a particular uh, factor, okay? So in other words, these, uh, these uh, Laplacians associated to the edges are, are uh, like small building blocks for all of the higher Laplacians, okay? So now we could try to use this to, um, to uh, rewrite the equation uh, delta squared minus lambda delta for, uh, for the group GN for some higher index uh, just using this. But the problem is the group SL2, S out of two and uh, SL2, they do not have property T. So these Laplacians for the edges, they will not satisfy anything. So what we need to do instead is relate the Laplacian on, for some higher index to the Laplacian on, well, another index, but maybe not two, okay? And this is, uh, this is the formula that, that one can uh, that, that does this, okay? So if M is greater or equal than N greater or equal than three, then if for the higher index, if you, uh, if you uh, take the sum of the permutations of the Laplacians, then um, uh, for, from the level N, then you get the Laplacian on the level M up to a constant, okay? All right, so the, the general idea will be to try to decompose the Laplacian, the equation delta squared minus lambda delta using these types of formulas into, uh, so, so we take the, uh, we, we, we're gonna try to take the equation on a higher level and decompose it to get, um, uh, to, to put it together from the pieces on a, on a lower level where we know something, okay? 
All right, so the next thing we need to do is we want to define three elements of the group ring. So these are these will be helpful in what we need to do next. Uh, and so these will uh, so these will give you a decomposition of the square of the Laplacian. Okay, so we we the formulas from the previous slide they give a decom decomposition of the Laplacian itself, but the square of the Laplacian behaves slightly differently. And um, we have three. Uh, so so if I if I take the Laplacian to be the sum of the small Laplacians associated to the edges, and I take it square, I will get a sum of uh, products of Laplacians associated to the edges, right? And now coming back to what can happen to the edges, we either have that the two are the two edges are the same and I get the square part of the, the Laplacian squared, or they're adjacent and then I get the adjacent part or they're opposite and then I get the opposite part. Altogether, they give, uh, they give Laplacian squared. Okay, so now the uh, an important fact is that two of these are already sums of squares. Okay, so the square part and the opposite part are sums of squares. So the square part, this is this is clear, right? I mean, so these are just um, these are just this is just a sum of squares of the Laplacians associated to the to the to the edges. And for the opposite part, uh, we will use the commutativity uh, that that we have. From the fact that we have these Laplacians associated to uh, opposite edges. Okay, so if so, here is a formula for the Laplacian. This uh, this appeared in Marek's talk. Uh, so if E and F are opposite edges, then the generators associated to them commute, and I can rewrite this whole thing as a sum of squares by simply commuting these guys. So this is uh, so this is important. So so the the key takeaway here is that most of the difficulty is con contained in this adjacent part of the of the square of the Laplacian. Okay. So here are the formulas that give us uh, these stable decompositions uh, for the adjacent and the opposite part. Okay. So. If I take the adjacent part on the level N and act on it by the alternating group from the level M, I'll get the adjacent part on the level M modulo a constant. And there is a similar formula for the opposite part. Okay. So, so now we have all the pieces and uh, here's the main technical statement, which, so this works for, uh, for SLNZ and S out of N. Uh, so for SLNZ for, for N greater or equal than three and S out of N for N greater or equal than seven. For N equal to six, there is a, an additional argument needed, but I'll just stick to this. Uh, so the technical statement is the following. So if N is greater or equal than three, and this element, the adjacent part plus k times the opposite part minus lambda times the Laplacian is a sum of squares. And the xi i's are supported in the ball of radius r uh, for some k and lambda. Then gm has property t for every m greater than n, greater than n, which satisfies this. And the Kajdan radius is bounded with both by R. Okay, so this is the technical statement. Here's how you prove it. So you rewrite delta M squared minus lambda delta using these formulas that, that appeared earlier. And uh, so, so here, I'll, this, this uh, coefficient here is already adjusted. So. I'll rewrite this delta squared as squared part plus the adjacent part plus the opposite part. Uh, and this is, so I'll divide the opposite part into two pieces and pull one of the pieces into this and decompose this using, or rewrite this using one of the, um, one of the formulas that we, uh, uh, the two formulas that we had before 
And what I'll get is something like this. So now this part is already positive, okay? This part is positive by the assumption, okay? And now this part, opposite, the opposite part is positive. So the only question is when is this uh, coefficient positive? And this is precisely the assumption uh, that give us that gives us uh, for which indices this works. Okay, so this is uh, this is essentially the proof. Okay, so what can you what can you get out of this? Well, so uh, the explicit uh, statements are that S out of n has property t for n greater or equal than six with Kajdan radius two and the following estimate on the Kajdan constant. Uh, and uh, the proof is by certifying the adjacent part uh, plus two times the opposite par part minus 0 0.138 of the Laplacian in S odd F5, okay? And then, then uh, uh, and, and they're, they, they are certified on the ball of radius two. So uh, using this, this theorem I mentioned, uh, you get this kind of a statement. Okay, so now uh, there's, there's a certification that, that was, uh, um, um, that we realized is, is uh, true also in S out of four that proves property T for N greater or equal than 103. So the, the upshot here is that this group uh, S out of four is much more manageable and this is a much faster uh, computation, but, the, but you get, um, the, the index that you get is worse. So this, this, I think if I remember correctly, this takes a few minutes, right, to compute. Okay, but as I said, everything that, that we did also uh, applies to SLNs, okay? And we get some new results for SLNs. So for SLN, uh, for, uh, for five, maybe two hours, three hours? Okay. I think when we, when we, were, when we wrote the paper, it was a few hours. It's constantly improving. <laughs> okay, so for, for SLN, but I think the first one that we did was like a week, right? The one with Taka, I think it was a week. <laughs> so yeah, so for SLNs, uh, for n greater or equal than three, uh, what you get is you get the Kajdan radius to be equal to two and you get a Kajdan constant estimate, uh, which is new. Um, I'll, I'll uh, uh, give more details on the next slide. So the, the way you do this, you just certify the adjacent part alone, okay? Uh, so it turns out that the adjacent part has this algebraic spectral gap and uh, it's certified positive with it on the ball of radius two. So we get a new estimate on the Kajdan constant uh, this way, but there is an even better one if we certify this element. So the adjacent part uh, in SL5 plus 1.5 times the opposite part minus 1.5 to Laplacian. So this is the estimate that, that one gets out of that. Okay, so the previously known bounds for SLN were by Kasabov, uh, the lower bounds, this was, uh, this was uh, uh, from 2005. And there is a general upper bound uh, by Zhuk, which is uh, by spurred of two over N. So if you compare this to Zhuk's upper bound, then uh, the, asymptotically this, this lower bound is one half of Zhuk's upper bound. Uh, so this is for N greater or equal than six, uh, this, this certification. Okay. All right. So uh, this is this was also something that Marek mentioned: the product replacement uh, algorithm. So it was it was open uh, for uh, for uh, 
a, a bit uh, uh, why, basically why the, this algorithm works as fast as it, as it, as it does. Uh, and uh, there was a, uh, an explanation provided, a theoretical explanation pro provided by Lubotsky and Pak in 2001. So they showed that if, if AudFN would have property T, this would explain it um, um, because these, uh, this algorithm is essentially implemented by, uh, by uh, random walks uh, of AudFN. Okay, so this this in particular explains this. Uh, so so it it uh, puts the final piece in this explanation of Lubotsky and Pak. Uh, there's another uh, application. So there was a question uh, by Alex: uh, Is there a sequence of finite groups such that their Cayley graphs are expanders for one set of generating sets, but but not expanders for another set of generating sets? So this goes back to his uh, book. And this was answered uh, by Kasalov in 2003. So he showed that for a certain sequence of symmetric groups, um, this, this happens, right? So, you, so there are certain generating sets for which they are expanders, but they, might, they, they are not expanders with uh, the standard uh, generating sets. Uh, so we, what we get uh, is, uh, is an alternative answer to this, which has some advantages. So in 1977, Gilman uh, showed that AudFN is residually alternating for, uh, uh, for n greater or equal than three. But what it uh, means is that AudFN, for every n greater or equal than three, AudFN projects onto infinitely many alternating groups. And uh, well, so because of this, uh, the sequences of alternating groups uh, with uh, generating uh, ge generators from uh, uh, from these that come from these Nielsen um, transformations are expanders, but they're known not to be expanders with their usual generating sets. Okay, so this gives an alternative answer, and and the upshot is uh, that uh, this, these generating sets are uh, explicit become because they come from these Nielsen transformations. And for Kasabov, I think originally they were not very explicit. Um, so this turned out to be uh, uh, an interesting uh, situation that you have property T group, which is residual, residually alternating. And recently there are some more examples that were provided. Uh, there are papers on the archive by uh, Pierre Manuel Capras and, and, and Martin Kasabov, and also with, by Bartoldi and Kasabov. So this, these are quite recent. Um, okay, and uh, the last thing is that uh, the last, the last thing. So the, the thing that we that that, is, that was missing for a little bit was order four, um, and order four was actually the group that we started with with Marek uh, because uh, it's the smallest, uh, the the most manageable among these. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we didn't get anything, right? So we tried the ball of radius two and we didn't get a positive answer and the ball of radius three is already too large to handle. Uh, but there is a paper by Martin Nietzsche um, and uh, he, he has, uh, he modified this, this approach. Uh, he still uses uh, a numerical computation, but he modified this approach to be able to go to a slightly larger set and he was able to confirm property T for out of four. Uh, there is another development, uh, again, uh, this has already appeared, but um, uh, I think a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nietzsche also posted a preprint where he shows that all but finally many of the auto fans have property T and his proof does not use any computations. And uh, as a last comment, uh, which uh, um, is, that, is that with, with Uri Bader, we, uh, we were motivated actually by, by a question uh, uh, that we heard from Alex Lubotsky about uh, can some of these methods be uh, generalized to higher cohomology? And his, his motivation was uh, stability uh, 
in particular these uh, so so he they have a paper i think with uh, with tom uh Glebsky and uh forgetting the fourth author uh but the 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 key ingredient in that paper is vanishing of unitary uh, of oh, sorry of uh vanishing of second cohomology with unitary coefficients okay with all unitary coefficients and that's that's a condition that they need now as I mentioned, uh, property T can be characterized by the same condition in degree one. So, um, so the question was whether one can uh, prove a characterization like Ozawa, but for vanishing of higher cohomology. So we, we, we did that with Uri and there are some actually further, there's some further work on this where you can actually prove spectral gaps in higher dimensional um, cohomological Laplacians using similar methods. So that's something that's, that I'm still working on. Um, yeah. All right, so I'll stop here, thank you. Uh, are there any questions, comments? Um, thanks. Do, do you know who, uh, who, uh, for what sequence of ends um, Gilman's theorem no. gives you? No, no. I, I, I don't think it's very explicit. Uh, so is it sparse or? Um, well, um, no, I'm, I, I'm not able to tell you much, but uh, it's, 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 it's a statement, if I remember correctly, it's a statement that it, it exists essentially. Uh, there is not much that one can say. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, any other questions? Comments? So, thank our speaker again.